It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Uh, as time is short, and I'm leaving town at 4.30 tomorrow, I only have a few hours, and uh, therefore I will uh, go right to the essential matter. Uh, Jewish is a subject much discussed, more often than not, in the wrong way. People make what I consider to be inappropriate judgments all the time. <coughs> And it's a subject, therefore, that requires a re-examination, <coughs> and one with great care. One has to have a lot of erudition about a lot of different things to situate the behavior of the Jews in the right way, and I'll try to do that. I apologize in advance that some of the things I will say will be very brief, and they will be in the form of a kind of a shorthand but I hope they will be intelligible uh, to you. The second thing is, though I will concentrate on resistance, of course, the larger context of the Shoah always needs to be remembered. The dehumanization, the starvation, the violence, the oppression, the mass death. And therefore, one should not exaggerate resistance, nor underestimate resistance, but try in some way to located in the right way amidst the world that had never existed before. <coughs> I apologize in advance if I cough a little bit. But it's the product of some lectures in Spain last week. <coughs> Let me start right in with 1933, when Hitler came to power in Germany. The German Jews were caught largely unawares. They were enormously proud to be Germans. But the fact is that right from the first, from 33 to 39, German Jewry produced great heroism. Martin Buber and the Jewish community leadership with Leo Beck, the head of the Jewish community, rallied the community spiritually, politically, economically to the degree that was possible. They created soup kitchens, medical services, social services, educational services, every kind of service that a community needs, which had previously been part of the mainstream. The most important act of resistance, however, that I want to mention to you is that about 500 to 550,000 Jews lived in Germany, and about 300 to 330,000 migrated. That is to say, they resisted with their feet. They were not passive. The idea that Jews were just passive, waiting for their murder, is altogether inaccurate about German Jewry. About half of those Jews went to the land of Israel. And of course, the contribution was enormous. Others went elsewhere. Of course, that was a difficulty because the world was not very welcoming, including, I must say, with sadness, uh, the <coughs> Irish Republic. In addition, the Jews of Austria, who added another 180,000 or so to the number of Jews in Germany, also saw a migration of about 80 to 110,000 Austrian Jews, out of a relatively small community. So to talk about resistance from the first is to understand that Jews acted with vigor to pick themselves up, to try to find places to go, not to do so uh, easily, but to try repeatedly. When the war began, <coughs> there were about 10,000 Jews still left in Berlin after 39. They were known as submarines. They went underground, under the sea. Of those, about 3,000 survived in the perilous conditions uh, of Nazi Germany. As late as 1942 and 43, we have Jewish Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts trying to organize various forms of resistance in Germany and especially in Berlin. Now I want to talk, first of all, about some things you need to know before you say you know something about this subject. You're in a position to make a judgment. The first is that no one believes in 1933, and no one believes in 1935, and no one believes in 1939 that there will be genocide. And the reason is important, ladies and gentlemen. People often talk erroneously as if Hitler had already planned the final solution in 1920s in the 
book he wrote, Mein Kampf, and then in his secret book in 26. The fact is there is no mention of genocidal policy in any of those books and even into the 30s. What Hitler does in Mein Kampf and in the secret book, he talks about stringing up 12,000 Jewish profiteers who led to the defeat in 1918. There's no discussion of mass death. In the 1930s, there's no discussion of genocide. No one could foresee it, and therefore to expect the Jews to have foreseen it is to see history backwards. This was an unprecedented decision, even until the end of 1941, and therefore people acted according with that current wisdom. I call to your attention, if you need evidence of that, that there is no budget line for murdering Jews on a large scale till the end of 41. And if you don't have a budget line, you don't have a project. Secondly, even once the decision was made on the final solution, the fact is that it was such an unprecedented decision that it was unbelievable. There's a famous story of Jankowski, the great Polish underground fighter who came to Washington to see Felix Frankfurter, the Jewish representative on the Supreme Court, and he told Frankfurter about the death camps, and Frankfurter said to him, I don't deny what you say, but I don't believe it either. Because it was unbelievable to try to assimilate the kind of phenomenon we're describing. The Fovitz, the Jewish newspaper in New York, in 1942 got a memo saying the death camps were up and operating. They didn't know to publish it or not. They held a meeting and they said, if we don't publish it, history won't forgive us if we're wrong. If we do publish it, history will forgive us if we're right. So they published the story about the death camps on an inside page in small print. No one could believe it. That's an important thing to remember. Thirdly, fourthly, you have to remember Jews were very divided. The idea of an international Jewish conspiracy, the myth of the protocols of the elders of Zion, the common ideas about Jewish power, which were so widely circulated in anti-Semitic circles, were all a lie. Jews were powerless in the main, especially in Eastern Europe. Everywhere they were deeply divided. Unfortunately, that's a circumstance of Jewish life, it seems. Two Jews, three opinions. <laughs> the fact is that Jewish communists and Bundists decided to set their fate with the non-Jewish communists. The Jewish right <coughs> would not get into bed in any way with the Jewish left. The Jewish community was divided by religion. There were the Hasidim. There were the Haredim, the neo-Orthodox in Germany of uh, Samson Raphael Hirsch. There were the neologues, the Reform in Hungary. There were the Reform community in the West. They were divided by class. They were divided by education. They were divided by language. There was no common Jewish communal organization that cut across Europe. The Jews of France, the Jews of Poland <coughs> had very little to do with each other. The Austrian were generally looked down on by Western Jewry. If I had time, I would take you through the divisions in the different ghettos. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising that everyone knows came about late when the ghetto was already depleted because the left Zionist Shomer Tzair of Anilevitz couldn't get along with the Jabotinsky revisionists till the very end. Kruk in his diary in Vilna tells us about the deep division between the right and the left in the ghetto which made it difficult until 42 to form an alliance. <coughs> in the Bialystok ghetto, there was enormous division between the Zionists and the Bundists and the people on the right. In Krakow, everywhere division, division. It's a very unhealthy thing, ladies and gentlemen. Fifth, Jewish relations with local populations were invariably bad. This is an important point. <coughs> You know you were a minority population to begin with. <coughs> you have no military units. 
You're not a national army of a normal sort, so you need support. But invariably, relations with local populations were very bad. The Polish underground, until the very end, when it was really forced by circumstance to give a very minimal amount of support from a huge arms cachet that the Allies had dropped to them, did not support the Jewish underground. The official Polish underground never put out a call, never put out a call to the German, Polish people to ask the Poles to help Jewish partisans. <coughs> we also know, of course, the stories of places like Yedvabna, where local populations rose up and murdered their Jewish neighbors. All over Poland, the fact is that there was very bad, very bad relations. In the Ukraine, Ukrainian nationalism, without going into detail, was violently anti-Jewish. The nationalists saw the sacrifice of the Jews as something necessary to complete their own successful nationalist ambitions. In Lithuania and Latvia, up in the Baltics, conditions were horrific. And of course, in Lithuania, the participation of local Lithuanians in the murder of the Jews through the Arras uh, Commando, the participation in the daily slaughter of places like Panari outside of Vilna. In most of the Western, in most of the Eastern governments, the government was rapidly unsympathetic. Romania, Hungary, Slovakia, all of them were official allies of the Third Reich. Hitler, uh, Eichmann came to Budapest with a hundred men, but he was able to kill over 400,000 Jews in 56 days in the late spring and summer of 44. He didn't do it by himself, he did it with the help of Hungarians. And Slovakia, Tiso, who was a Catholic priest, actually went to the Germans and said, please take my Jews. In fact, I'm so anxious that you take my Jews, I'll pay you. I'll give you a fee for every Jew you deport, but you must give me an obligation, a commitment, that the Jews will not return. And of course, they were willing to make that bother. In Russia, Hitler gave 33 speeches during the war, <coughs> and none of them was the Holocaust mentioned, and only one, the Jews were mentioned, and what was happening was described as a pogrom. In official communiques put out by the Soviet press, there was an embargo on content about Jewish material. And even as the various extraordinary commissioners went around trying to collect information, for example, in 43, there was a special commission to try to discover what happened to Bob Ayar. But the fact is that no mention was made of Jews. It was so to Soviet citizens that were said to have been murdered without any reference to their religious or special identification. In Western Europe, too, it should be remembered, there was not much help. I mentioned just uh, one or two places because of their importance. In Holland, everyone thinks of Holland as a place of great support. So I take it specifically to point out to you that more Dutch belong to the Nazi movement there were more people who were part of the collaborationist environment, including the chief of police in Amsterdam, than belonged to the Dutch resistance. And despite the fact of the cover that the story of Anne Frank seems to supply to the Dutch, you all know that Anne Frank was eventually betrayed, and she died of typhus in the camp. In France, of course, you had the Vichy regime, which was officially committed to the eradication of French Jewish life. Mussolini, uh, as we now know, with the myth of a kind of benign Mussolini is increasingly crumbling under new evidence. The work laws, it's true Mussolini we did not want to cooperate in genocide and the murder of Jews, but lack of sympathy was certainly in evidence. Even in Western allies, who you would have thought would have been sympathetic or not. I don't want to go too far in that direction, but I just mentioned to you the British were 
not sympathetic despite the repeated, it's one of the ironies of the war. I have no doubt that Churchill was genuinely sympathetic to the Jewish plight as a person. And one reads about him crying in the halls of the parliament. But the fact is that Britain did nothing really once the war began of consequence. I tell you only two incidents. In 43, the British government agreed publicly to allow 29,000 Jewish children to come to Britain from Bulgaria and Romania, <coughs> and to then allow them to go on to Eretz Israel, to go to Palestine, under the 75,000 that were agreed by the 39 white paper. Now that the British uh, archives are open, we know that the British government did everything it could to block the travel of these children, and not one of the 29,000 made it to freedom. Secondly, I mentioned to you Lord Moyne. It's a very terrible story. Lord Moyne uh, was the commissioner in Egypt. And Himmler had an idea in 1944, May 44, if I remember correctly, that he would negotiate with the Allies for much needed supplies. So he sent a Jew named Yol Brand, a Hungarian Jew with a minder, to make their way from Hungary to Egypt and to appeal to the British government about the negotiation to let out Jews for trucks. When they got to uh, Egypt, they were all ready to explain that Himmler was willing to trade a million Jews for 10,000 trucks and some other supplies. What happened, however, was very curious. The British government locked up Joel Brand, kept him under house arrest, kept him under arrest for several months. And one of the assistants to Lord Moyne said to him, Ambassador, Lord Moyne, we could save a million Jewish lives. A million Jewish lives. But Lord Moyne is reported to have said, and what will I do with a million Jewish lives? Because of the white paper, because of other conditions. In the US, the record is not much better. The Roosevelt government was not a government that acted with alacrity or sympathy until 44, when Morgenthau embarrassed them, the Secretary of the Treasury. The State Department was riddled with uh, Southerners who were hostile to Jewish immigration. It's a very ugly story. The churches everywhere were unsympathetic. The Eastern Orthodox churches only, almost uniformly rang the bells when the Jews were being deported. And the Catholic Church, a story that's still an ongoing story, is a very unsatisfactory, has a very unsatisfactory record. <coughs> Pius XII uh, is the subject of much debate today. I would just say the following. He certainly is not a moral monster, as he's made out by some. And he was not a saint, as his partisans would like to now declare him. The fact is, Pius failed. The traditional position of the church, which ironically is to save Jewish lives. The reason Jews survived 1,500 years under Roman domination, Christian domination, from Constantine conversion in the 4th century, until, say, the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution. Remember, they survived 1,500 years under Christian domination because the church wanted them to survive. The church, for all of its deep anti-Jewish animus, had an 11th commandment, partly based in theology, partly based in morality, thou shalt not destroy the Jews. Pius failed to live up to that traditional historical legacy. What he could have done, should have done, is very complicated, and I won't go there because of time. Also, you have to remember that when we try to understand what Jews were calculating, they were looking out at a Europe that had proven a feat in the face of the Wehrmacht. In almost no time, in really a series of lightning strikes, the German army had taken the Low Countries, France, for all of its marginal line and all of its myth about superiority, had collapsed almost completely. The Blitz against Poland took three weeks. Despite myths, the Poles fought very bravely, but they were very outmanned. They had a 
First World War Army against the Second World War Army. Fortunately, the British had the channel, but otherwise the British had been defeating Dunkirk. looked very bad. The Russians collapsed in the first few months of the war. They lost millions, millions, not hundreds of thousands, millions, five million prisoners of war. And therefore, you need to reflect on all of these factors before you make judgments about what was possible and what was like or not. Also, it's important to understand that this had no precedent. To try to get a handle on this was not easy. So let me now go to the ghettos. Resistance in the ghettos. What do we do with resistance in the ghettos? What was life like in the ghettos for those who we talk about so blithely? You have to remember that in all the ghettos, people were starving to death. Food was in critically short supply. Everyone was starving. Everyone was cold. There was no uh, heat allowed in the ghetto. The fact is that the Jews in the ghetto were different. <coughs> in Eastern Europe, the Jews married young for religious reasons. They had children by the age of 22 or 23. They had responsibility. They still lived in a community which was an extended family of parents and grandparents, sisters, brothers, children. Therefore, the choices that they made had to be made in the context of what was good, not only about their running away, they're picking themselves and doing X or Y, but what might bear consequences for their family. As work permits were given out, <coughs> it was often these young men, young women, who were the only ones who had a work permit which brought with it food. If they didn't bring home a few calories, they knew everyone would be dead. In addition, in the ghettos, you have to keep in mind something very important. Reprisals. You know, we talk about reprisals. You know that the Nazis carried out reprisals in places, for example, in the town of Lidice, where uh, Heydrich was murdered by the Czech underground. You have to realize that, given the fact that the Germans had absolutely no regard for Jewish life, considered Jews undimensioned, subhumans, held the view, literally held the view, that the destruction of the Jewish community was a public health measure, like wiping out pests or cancer. They had no limits on their willingness to murder Jews in reprisals. Now what that meant is, both individually and collectively, the leadership of every ghetto had to ask itself, what is going to be the consequence of some act of physical act of resistance by the underground or a small group of Jews. The Jewish councils, much maligned, and sometimes rightly, the Jewish council is a very mixed issue I don't have time to talk about, but the Jewish councils understood that their responsibility was to keep the ghetto in operation. If they allowed, in certain circumstances, for actions that the Nazis had forbidden, they had a violation of their obligation to the whole ghetto, which might be liquidated. And therefore, by and large, the ghetto leadership adopted a strategy which they thought would work. They adopted a strategy which was called work for life. That they would work, they would make themselves useful, they would become important to the German war effort, they turned the ghettos into factories of mass munitions production, and the Germans therefore would trade with them. Now this already involved moral difficulties because it meant you had to give up those who were not productive, the elderly, children, but at least the core of the Jewish people would survive. And so that calculation was a very powerful one adopted almost universally in the ghettos. However, the ghetto leadership misunderstood the situation, and this is important. What did they misunderstand? 
they were working under what I would call a misplaced historical paradigm. First of all, they thought that it was a rational relationship that they had between themselves and the Third Reich. They didn't understand that in the end, all the Nazi state wanted from Jews was that they become corpses. That was the only object. Jewish labor was very marginal at best, but the Jews did not understand that. Secondly, they misunderstood the historic paradigm of slavery. Santayana, the great uh, his philosopher and star in at Harvard, once said, if you don't study history, you're bound to repeat it. Well, the Jews had studied history, but they mistook its meaning. They thought they were now like slaves. But masters don't kill their slaves. Masters reproduce their slaves. Masters look to increase the slave population. But the fact is, none of those calculations of turning themselves into workers and into slaves, willingness to trade life for work, made any sense because the Nazis were playing by a totally different game <coughs> called the final solution to the Jewish problem. Not production. There was no calculation made of a serious kind with regard to the Jewish population of Europe as to its productive capacities once the solution, final solution was made. 